Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I surrender Jesus. I surrender Jesus. My will, my ambition, I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. Fathers, we now make our way toward this last segment. We know now that the calling has already gone forth. We've already heard the commission. And we're now preparing God to make it absolute. We're prepared now to stand before you and make a commitment to leverage our time, our talent, to do your work. We pray, God, that you would anoint this moment in Jesus' name. And everyone say amen. amen. And you may be seated. When Abigail, my daughter, was 18 years old, we began to work through the more difficult phase of determining what a career for her would look like. We'd already put forth all the endeavor as it pertained to God's will, fasting, prayer. But now it's time to enter into the college phase. And what do you want to do the rest of your life? It's a tough place to be. Many people engage in this endeavor without really understanding their giftings or their passions. And the results can be devastating. Applying yourself to a four-year degree, securing the intern, landing the job, entering into the workplace, only then to realize after six months that you hate your job. You abhor everything about it. Parking lot, the hours, the weird refrigerator, the work itself. Now you're stuck. What do you do? You either start over or you spend the next 40 years pulling into that same parking lot. This is where we get the terminology, do what you love and you will never work a day in your life. How does this apply to the Christian life? We have a sin problem. I'm not talking about committing sin as much as I'm talking about the sin struggle that is apparent to the human nature. Sin is everywhere. In our communities, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our relationships, in our churches, certainly within our own conscience. This war against sin consumes us. We rise early in the morning with the prayer, lead us not into temptation. And we conclude in the evening, God forgive us for our entanglement with sin. The majority of our discipleship is premised on how to avoid and overcome immorality. We enter into our church services where we are reminded of the possibilities of iniquity, the proximity of iniquity, and the power of iniquity. But what if I told you there was a different way? If loving what we do takes work out of life, is it possible that we can love God in a certain way that would neutralize sin? God put a gift inside of you. You are on this earth to do more than overcome sin. You are here to pour out your gift. For we are God's workmen created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He's purposed for you to do great things, and he's calling you to do great things. Here's a statement I want to register with your heart. Often, inactive Christians are struggling Christians, yet active Christians rarely struggle with major sin. I'm not talking about spiritual warfare. That's part of the mission. What I'm referring to is what Paul wrote in Hebrews 6. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Let me put it to you in this way. Instead of 
constantly having to go back and repent, why not teach others the way of repentance? Paul speaks plainly. It's time for the next phase. Repentance from dead works and faith should be rock solid. Let's move to action. Let's move to purpose. Let's move to evangelism. There's a reason why God said to Abraham, everywhere you put your foot upon the land, I will give it. God wanted him moving. Jesus entered into the, the, the temptation of his life in Matthew 4. And there he was tempted of Satan three times and overcame him by the word. We never read where Jesus was ever tempted of Satan again in that capacity. Do you know why? The Bible says he left the wilderness and entered immediately into his purpose. He went from being tempted of the devil to standing in the temple and declaring, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach. How quickly we move from temptation into purpose determines how often we are tempted. As long as I stay in the wilderness, I am in proximity to the tempter's vices. But when I head to the temple and pick up the scroll and find my mission verse, the tempter loses his power. I know how to quote that which is capable of resisting the tempter, but now I'm in the habit of quoting those verses that release my anointing. He has anointed you to preach the gospel, you to heal the brokenhearted, you to preach deliverance of captivity, you recovery of sight to the blind, to set at them that are bruised to liberty. God wants to activate someone today in Bible study endeavor. Satan concludes his diabolical plan regarding Job in the second chapter of Job. The book is 42 chapters long. Think about it. Only the first two chapters involve the voice of Satan. God does not answer Job's cry until the 38th chapter. So four chapters are committed to God rebuilding Job. That leaves 36 chapters in the middle. For 36 chapters, Satan is absent and God does not answer. 36 chapters that are not determined by Satan's work or God's revelation. Their premise, rather, on Job wondering what in the world is going on. As long as I stay in the valley of why, why me? Why am I always struggling? Why am I always in this same cycle? Why can I break through to joy? If I continue to write unnecessary and unproductive chapters, I will never find my mission. Jesus himself cried out on the cross while dying, why? But then he gave up the ghost. I must believe and understand that all of the whys in my life account to one thing. He has purposed me to be effective in ministry. And the sooner I can yield myself to that, the quicker I can get to resurrection power. In Luke 10, Jesus releases 70 to do the work of evangelism. He says to them, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Luke 10 and 2. They come back in verse 17 with joy saying, Lord, even the devils were subject to us in thy name. And Jesus answered, yes, but notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but re rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In effect, Jesus declares, it's not really a big deal that the enemy was subject to you. You see, you were in the harvest. And while you're in the harvest, the enemy is going to be subject to you. But then I would add this, rejoice because your names are also written in heaven. Listen to the doctrine of Luke 10. It suggests that for those that are in the harvest, they have authority over satanic forces and authority in eternal redemption. This is why the enemy wants to keep you 
in the position of why me. But I would encourage you to put everything aside that has afflicted your mind, spirit, and heart. Rise in an anointing and declare today, in the next three months, I will teach a Bible study and release the ministry power of Jesus Christ into my life. I'm tired of being in the cycle I'm in. I'm tired of dealing with the same factors I've been dealing with. And I realize to stay where I'm at is to continue where I'm at. I want to rise to excellence and spiritual effectiveness and do something for God that will command that my circumstances have to deal with a new level of anointing working in my life. If you have that as your passion, I want you to clap your hands and give a shout to God right now. I want you to shun that. I want you to believe right now the anointing is resting upon you. It's a new season. It's a new day. You're called to do this. But when you step into it, things are going to change in your life. They're going to change in your relationships. Allow me to remain in the framework of leaving those principles of doctrine in Christ and going under perfection. But at a critical point. And this point here will be the thrust of our conclusion for today. And I won't be much long, longer after this point is released. And this is the reason why I'm here today. There is and must be a graduation from new birth into discipleship. And we never stop growing in discipleship. In some seasons, we grow deep, and at other times in life, responsibilities and cares and circumstances cause us to not grow as effectively. Now, in the true Christian, the seasons of growth awaken a calling. But what I have noticed is that many Christians have made a calling out of discipleship. That personal advancement in Jesus for them is the whole of the matter. But that's simply not the case. Let me demonstrate and compare two parables. One I've already expressed today, and I will refresh it briefly just for this purpose. In a parable in Matthew 25, Jesus speaks concerning one who received a talent who did not act properly. To one, he gave five. To another, he relinquished two. To another, he gave one talent. And in the parable, the one that received the five and the one that received the two doubled their talents in return. Here's the question. Who are those talents given to? And should one expect to double his or her talent? For comparison, in another parable, Jesus spoke concerning types of soil. In Matthew 13, that the seed fell upon good ground and it bare fruit. He spoke concerning negative distractions prior to that affect productivity. Even that of the good soil, though he said that some will yield 30 and others 60. Now here are two parables with certain numbers attached that hold to productivity. And if we're not careful, we will misread and misrepresent their critical distinction. For they speak of two different truths. Talents are given based on the understanding of the master regarding the servant. To every man he gave according to his several ability. Talents mean weight, two-way, as in a balance. Talents are kingdom Currency, a certain weight held in a balance that's meant for kingdom impact that at some point God, the master, puts in my spirit. But the seed and the soil are different concepts. The sower does not consider the soil. He just throws the seed. There's no intimate knowledge involved. In other words, the seed is not sown according to the ground's several ability. 
The seed and the soil parable is about the progression of discipleship and the fruit it bears. When one cultivates their heart, prayer, fasting, worship, growing in the word, they're going to become productive, naturally productive. And the more time they can give to it, the more productivity in Christ is going to mature. Here's the difficulty. People feel the weight of a talent and think it's the familiar call of advancement in discipleship. You've been in the church a long time. You know what it feels like when God says, come deeper still. And you feel this certain weight <laughs> that begins to rest upon you. And you think, oh, I know what this is. I felt this when I was in high school. I felt this when I was in college. You know, when I had time to really put aside and pray commanding prayers and entered into and engaged in levels of fasting. And the word was flowing in my life with such radical focus. But then I had a, a family and, and then I took on a marriage and then I took on a job and a career. But I, I know what you're talking about, Pastor. That's the weight of evangelism. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 of discipleship, but I've come to tell you something. In the Spirit of God, under the unction of an anointing, what you feel is not God asking you for deeper commitments in discipleship. It's God moving you beyond that into a talent. You only wrestle with a talent when the Master has marked your abilities. He came by not long ago <laughs> and looked into your heart, looked into your life and said, there's kingdom capacity there. And he laid upon you something now that you're wrestling with, but you keep pushing back on it. But I've come to tell you in the Holy Spirit, be careful, because what you're wrestling with is not just God's calling for you to be deeper in spiritual matters. It's God saying, I'm ready for you to double what I've put in your spirit as a productive Christian in me. Here's what I know, that you know him, that he is a hard man reaping where he has not sown and gathering where he has not strawed. Be careful that you're not saying no, not just to an increase again in personal fruitfulness but that you're saying no to major kingdom impact. It's not fruit production that he's stirring. It's kingdom talent that he's stirring. For many are called, but I've come to tell you that you, sir, you, ma'am, he has chosen. The greatest mistake in the life of the unfaithful servant of Matthew 25 is not realizing that he had moved past discipleship and was now a talent keeper. He had no idea what had transpired in his life, that his knowledge of God was far deeper than the average person, and that the master's knowledge of him was far deeper than the average person. And thus he dug a hole and buried a talent because that's what discipleship does. We bury the seed. We bury the truth to make sure that we never let it go. But more than discipleship, he's calling you now to be a witness. And I'm releasing now the Spirit of God into this sanctuary to once again tug on your mind, your heart, and your will. And I'm asking you, I'm asking you under the unction of the Holy Spirit, Will you give your life absolutely to evangelism? Will you say with those thousands of people across this globe who have, who have given themselves over radically through the years to the work of God, crying out in all types of places, in all types of languages, not my will, but your will be done. God has placed in you a kingdom talent and he's asking will you double it and will you do it now I am and will, will remain as long as I can in my flesh as long as life continues a disciple I seek and pray as every pastor does 
for long, deep seasons where I can just fall in love with the Word all over again. We preach so much and we study and prepare so much to present that oftentimes we're not careful we will lose that discipleship tug. So I understand the two. But today, as a man in my close to be 50 years of living, I understand that there's a talent that God has put into me that I must labor under with such force for as long as God will continue to give breath to my body. This is why God struck down the fool in Luke 12 who said after he had tore down his barns and built bigger barns. So, take your ease. But God said, tonight thy soul is required of you. Not because he built new barns. He had mastered discipleship. He was a 100% producer. His discipleship was so so amazing that he tore down barns to build new barns. <laughs> he had mastered soil production. He had learned how to cultivate just right to maximize it. The problem was that one statement, soul, take your ease. Souls balanced against talent are never at rest, ever. Notwithstanding, here's what we learn in the parable of the unfaithful servant. If you and I will do anything other than bury the talent, God will double it. God will double it. This is why when it comes to talents, there's no sliding scale. Five produces five, two produces two.